I invite you to open a Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3, so we're going to begin there. And as you're opening a Bible and opening it up to 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to begin by going to God in prayer to prepare our hearts and minds to receive his word. So our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that they would receive the word of God this morning, be comforted and uplifted by the message of Jesus and his love for you. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would be encouraged and uplifted by the word of God, and that they would find a renewed love and treasure for his word and the scriptures. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me, that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God, proclaim boldly the message of hope found in Jesus Christ for all who believe in him. Psalm 19 says, may the words of the mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we begin the fall season, we're starting a new sermon series called The Good Book that's about the Bible. And obviously, hopefully by now, we've been together long enough that you know that I love the Bible and I want you to love the Bible and to not just love it, but to understand it, to be in it to grow in your understanding of it. And so as we dive into what the good book is, what the Bible is all about, this morning we start off by answering the question, what is the theme of the Bible? Yeah, some of you already said it. Jesus, we can go home now. That's the answer. All right. (laughs) But that is the answer. And the problem is, as simple as it is, we forget it. And if you don't forget it, you have friends and family and coworkers of people that forget it. And so the answer to the question, what is the theme of the book, is very simple. It is Jesus. But our problem is we forget it. And so many times people approach the Bible with the intention of finding anything but Jesus. So some people see the Bible and they see the theme of the Bible and they think, well, it's just filled with all this bad stuff and this angry God and this angry judge and so I don't want anything to do with it. Some people hear about the Bible and they think the theme of the Bible, it's just a bunch of made up myths and stories that could have never happened. But the most common way that I see people answer the question, what is the Bible about, is rules. Jesus is one of the least common answers I get. What is the Bible about? Most people say it's about rules. It's about morality. It's about doing this and not doing that. Most often that answer comes from people that if I ask them, oh, are you a Christian, would say, oh, absolutely. Right, one of my good friends in Houston, when he joined our church plant, this was his approach to scriptures. His view was you just read it, you do what it says, and then everything just works out. You just read it, you do what it says, God will take care of the rest. And so his attitude towards God was, I'm just trying to be as obedient as I can. I'm just trying to do all the rules and things that he has for me in the Bible. On the surface, that sounds great, right? Because how many of you are aware of the fact that there are some rules and instructions in the Bible, right? There are some do's and don'ts throughout God's word. There is right and there is wrong, there is righteousness, unrighteousness, all of that is true. But the main theme of the Bible is not to give you a list of do's and don'ts. The main theme of the Bible is actually a person named Jesus. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, as we dive in, that's what I want to look at this morning, is how do we know that the Bible is about Jesus and what does that mean for our life and faith? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 Paul is writing to a young man, and a young preacher who is basically his adopted son named Timothy. He's trying to encourage him, and so he's reminding him of certain things and certain truths. And he says in verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the scriptures, the Bible, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul is telling us to Timothy, here's the point of the scriptures. They are powerful. They are able to, 
do a work in your life which is to make you wise. And everybody wants to stop there and go, how many of you want to be wise? Would you like to make good decisions, right? You're like, oh. So how many of us ever go to the Bible, or maybe you're just hoping a scripture verse will pop into your mind when you have a tough decision to make that'll guide you? Anybody ever done that? I don't feel bad, like it's good to go to God's word. Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just like, hey, they're good for making you wise, and you go, amen. I'm gonna be smarter, better decision maker by tomorrow. Because that's one of the reasons, though, people go to the scriptures. They think the theme of the book is, it'll make me a better person. I'll be smarter, I'll be wiser. But Paul has a whole sentence here. He says, they're able to make you wise for something. It's not necessarily good decision making, but for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So before he says anything else about the scriptures, and I know there's a very famous verse that I haven't gotten to yet that you're cheating and looking ahead at. We haven't gotten there yet. Paul's saying, here's the first and primary purpose of the scriptures, to give you the knowledge of salvation found in Christ Jesus. Now, the other stuff comes. Make me wise, giving me maturity, helping me understand the world and my place in it, all these wonderful things. Verse 16, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete or fully mature, equipped for every good work. All right, so there it is. That everybody, here's what I see. Everybody always wants to jump to verse 16. I guarantee you verse 16 is more famous and more quoted than verse 15. Right? All scripture is God breathed. How many of you have heard that verse before? At least that part of it, right? It's super famous. All scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for all the things that what? Most people go to the Bible for. It's gonna be teaching me, it's gonna be reproof, it's gonna give me wisdom, correction, training in righteousness, I'll be a better person, fully mature, more complete, right? Equipped for every good work, I'll be able to serve and help people better. All that is what we call pragmatic stuff, practical stuff, right? And what we wanna do so often when we approach the scriptures we want to leap past verse 15 and go right to verse 16, right? Preacher, just give me the practical things, right? How many of you have some problems in your life that you're dealing with or tough decisions that you're trying to make? Anybody? No one, a few of us, great. The rest of you will comfort us after the service. <laughs> Y'all are amazing lives right now. <laughs> Well, so what do we do? We want to jump to verse 16 and be like, I need what? I need some training. I need some equipping. I need some correction. Reproof. I need some wisdom. I need these practical things. But here's something that's really profound and really important that I need you to get your heads around. Verse 15 comes before verse 16. Now, you can go ahead and chuckle, but you actually might want to write that down as a good reminder. Because Paul writes verse 15 first on purpose. He says, here's the main point, the primary thing that Scripture is all about, which is to make you wise for what? Salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, and then after that, it also trains up the Christian on how to live the Christian life. But you can't get verse 16 without verse 15. You can't get how to live the Christian life until you are a Christian until you put your faith in Jesus. And so Paul's saying, here's the primary purpose of the scriptures. Verse 15 comes first. It's all about Jesus, making us wise to know him and the salvation that is found in him. When I was at seminary, we have to take these classes called homiletics, which is a fancy word for preaching classes. You take Hom 1, homiletics 2, then they send you out on Vicarage and you come back for our homiletics three and four in your last year. And then, and then they send you out into the wild for you people to deal with, all right? <laughs> but it's an intimidating class. People ask me, do you ever get nervous when you're preaching? And the funny thing is, even though I have an anxiety disorder and I, don't, and I don't do well in crowds and I don't ever want to be in front of people, I never actually get nervous while preaching. So I think that's just God protecting me during while I'm in here, okay? <laughs> but you also are a lot less nervous preaching in front of a congregation after you've done your homiletics courses. Because in your homiletics class, 
you have to preach in front of all your classmates. And we're all given the exact same passage. So there's like 20 of us in the class, and you're gonna go, and then he's gonna go, and then he's gonna go, and then eventually gets to you, and we're all grading each other. Everybody's writing it down. It's being recorded. You have to grade yourself. So you wanna talk about feeling intimidated. It's getting in front of your classmates and saying, I know you already wrote your sermon on this passage, (laughs) or you've already given it, but here's my take on it. And then, of course, your professor is sitting in the back, and it's, he's all brooding and judgy and critical, all right? At least that's your perception of it. And you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Now, luckily for me, my first year at seminary is when you take this class. My brother was in his fourth and final year of seminary. So I asked him, I was like, dude, this is weird. <laughs> What do I do? And he goes, yeah, it's weird. And I remember talking to my brother about it, trying to get some comfort from me, my big brother. And at first, what he said was not very helpful, but later on it became helpful, right? And the first thing he told me is like, it's kind of like being a magician, doing a magic trick in front of a room full of magicians that already know how to do the trick. Because we have to preach on the same text and we're all saying generally the same thing. And I was like, that doesn't help me. That just makes me feel more self-conscious that they know what I'm gonna say already. And he goes, okay, this will help. And this really did help me. He goes, just remember when you get up to preach your sermon in front of your classmates, even pastors need the gospel. Even pastors need Jesus. And this is the point of the scripture. It's not just pastors that need Jesus and the gospel. It's not just you that needs the gospel and Jesus. It's Everybody, And if we have a misunderstanding of what scripture is about, we go out in the world, we tell everybody, oh, it's got some good advice for you. It's got some helpful notes and tips on how to be wise. We're not helping anybody. Because even preachers need the gospel and Jesus. Even you need Jesus and the gospel. And even your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers need Jesus and the gospel. And this is why it's so important that we get it right and that we understand that verse 15 is first. That the main theme of the book, the good book, the Bible, is Jesus and salvation in his name for all people. All right, so everybody needs the gospel. This is why it matters so much. So if you turn in your Bible to our gospel reading in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus is going to emphasize with us why this matters so much. John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people that love God They love their Bible, and they go to worship every week. So they love God, they love their Bible, and they go to worship every week. And Jesus looks at them and says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Another way of saying it is, Jesus is saying, you dive into the scriptures looking for the life that you're hoping for. You dive into the scriptures going, I'll just find what I'm looking for here. This will be the answer to all my problems, all my struggles, all my questions, all of these things. And then he goes, and yet it is they that bear witness about me. So what is he saying? What are the scriptures all about? What's the theme of the book? According to Jesus himself. It's Jesus himself. He's saying, you've been pouring over these things. You've been going back and forth going, oh, I'm having a tough day. Let me just find a a verse that'll comfort me a little bit, give me a little encouragement, give me some wisdom, whatever it might be. And he's saying, but you're missing the whole point. It's kind of a tough word to hear from Jesus, right? What do you mean I'm missing the point? He goes, if you come to the scriptures and you don't get me, you miss the point. A lot of people... A lot of times it's us and our own sinfulness. We come to the scriptures seeking our own morality. We come to the scriptures seeking our own self-improvement and looking for that. And we miss the whole point that the Bible is about Jesus. In verse 40, he says another convicting verse. He says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So what Jesus is saying is, you're missing the point. I, I'm here to give you the life that you are looking for, that you want, and more importantly, the life that you need. Because why did Jesus come? According to Paul, is to bring salvation, right? 
to bring a life where you are forgiven, you are loved, you are redeemed, a life that lasts forever where God will make all things right. He will correct all injustices and wrongs. He will wipe away every tear and we will get to be with him forever. Jesus says, that's what I came to give you. That's the life you're looking for and that's the life, more importantly, that you actually need. He says, that's what the Bible's about. Now there's a lot of other stuff in the Bible. There is wisdom, right? I mean, verse 16 is written by Paul. I agree with it. it. There is wisdom, there is correction, there is reproof, but Jesus is saying, but if you go looking for that and nothing else, you'll miss the main point. Jesus says, I'm the main point, and when you get me, you get the life you are looking for and the life you need, a life of salvation. So again, I want you to understand, why does this matter so much? Because it mattered to Jesus it mattered to Paul, and both of them making the point that, look, there's a lot of good in Scripture, but if you miss Jesus, you miss the main point, and you miss out on the life he is offering to all. And it also matters for how we share the Bible and share the Word of God with the world around us. Because it's very easy to present the Bible as nothing but a book of good advice when in reality it's a book of good news. Good advice tells people, do this and don't do that, and if you do these things, it'll all work out and God will take care of the rest, like my friend in Houston, and all these things. But Jesus, when he says, no, this book is about me and the life that I give to you, what he's saying is, it's a book of good news. It's an announcement of Jesus has come to bring life for all, to give salvation to all who believe in him. And that's the message that the world needs. How many of you have ever gotten tired when you are going through something difficult or a rough season in life of getting good, so-called good advice from friends and family? Anybody ever been fed up before? You're just like, I don't wanna hear from anybody else anymore. There's lots of good advice in the world. There's not a lot of good news. And you and I have a Bible, we have a book filled in all about good news. So it matters for our own hearts and our own salvation to remember that it's all about Jesus. But it also matters about how we share the word with others. Um, a couple of uh, quotes from one of my favorite uh, teachers, a man named Charles Spurgeon. He tells a story of a Welsh minister who was an older preacher and had been doing it for decades. And he went to church, and in the pulpit that Sunday was a young, brand new preacher. And so after the service, Spurgeon tells this story, the young man asked the older preacher, well, what do you think? Right, it's kind of like homiletics 101, all over again, all my fears and anxieties coming back. Well, what do you think? Now, to be fair, after most services, people either tell the preacher, good job, thank you, or nothing. <laughs> all right, now that doesn't mean I want you to start beating me up afterwards and telling me, horrible things, all right? But this young preacher asks the older, wiser Welsh preacher, well, what'd you think? And the older preacher, the story goes, looks at him in the eye and goes, it was a very poor sermon. So, oh, as a fellow preacher, I'm just like, oh, this poor young guy. <laughs> he, so he tells the young man, it was a very poor sermon. So the young man responded by saying, Will you tell me why you think it is a poor sermon? At least, you know, soften the blow a little bit. <laughs> Give me some advice and pointers. And this is what the Welsh minister told him. The older man said to the young preacher, it was a poor sermon because there was no Christ in it. There was no Jesus in it. Now, this is very important. This is not part of the story. This is very important. I want you to understand that the Bible is all about Jesus, so you know how to listen to good sermons and Bible teaching, read books and go, this is good, this is helpful, because it points you to Christ. Because there's a lot of books and theories out there on how to preach well, almost none of them have anything to do with Jesus. They all just have to do with how to be charismatic, enthusiastic, ask good questions, engage the audience, all these wonderful things. Essentially, how to give a TED talk. And so this young man hears well, there's no Christ in it, so it was a very poor sermon. But the young man argues back, because he's a young man, and this is what you do. He says, well, Christ was not in the text, right? It wasn't, Jesus' name wasn't in the Bible reading. 
So we are not to be preaching Christ always, he said. We must preach what is in the text. Now, on the sermon, it's kind of, kind of good. We're preaching the Bible, right? How many times do I open a sermon with, open a Bible? Y'all bored with that yet? It's the only intro you're going to get as long as I'm here, all right? So <laughs> buckle up and just get used to it. Right? He's saying, no, no, we're, there's no Christ in the text. We're just supposed to preach the text. And so the older man looked at him and he goes, don't you know, young man, that from every town and every village and every little hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road to London. And the young man said, yes, of course. So the old preacher said, and so it is with scripture. From every text in scripture, there is a road to the metropolis of the scriptures, that is Christ. And my dear brother, your business as a preacher is when you get to a text to say, now what is the road to Christ? and then go and preach a sermon running along the road towards the great metropolis of Jesus. So the point that the old man is making is, look, you can get to London from anywhere in England. It's the same thing with the scriptures. All the scriptures are there to point you to Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying here in John 5, right? You pour over the scriptures looking for eternal life. He says, but it's they that point to who? to Jesus himself, who's saying, it's all about me. And so when we read the Bible, when we go into God's word, we are looking for Jesus in our life. And when we share the word of God with people, we are to share a message of good news about Jesus and his life and his love and his salvation for people. A few more uh, quotes from Charles Spurgeon. He says this, did you leave Christ out? My brothers, better leave the pulpit out altogether. If a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. Certainly the last that any Christian ought to go to hear him preach. Which is pretty great advice. You want good advice, there's some good advice. Don't don't listen to people that aren't sharing Jesus from the Bible, because that's what the Bible is all about. And one last quote from Spurgeon. No Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching, which is one of my all-time favorites. The reason I always open my sermons with y'all by saying, open your Bible, it's because I love you. And I want you to know Jesus. And all of scripture, according to Jesus, is about him, friends. It's about the life that he offers you that you desperately need a life of forgiveness and redemption and hope and eternity, a life that gives to us salvation. So whether you are reading the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's all about Jesus. As Luther says, the Old Testament and the New Testament are the manger that hold Jesus for us. I've always loved that picture. And how many of you love Christmas? You're like, it's getting close. (laughs) And you're already counting down a little bit, right? And Jesus in the manger, our Savior. And Luther says, that's the scriptures. Holding him there for you, your Savior, who's come to earth to give you life and redemption and salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks that through your word, we have you. And we have the life, the redemption, the salvation that you offer to us by faith. May we approach your scriptures and your word looking for you each and every time. And when we share your word, when we share a message not of good advice, but of good news and hope and life found in your name. In your name we pray, amen.